this place! <laughs> Let's just go in and like kill all the orcs, right? They're the bad guys, who gives a shit? We just hack and slash and we loot their dead bodies, right? Hack and slash, kill them all, you know, conquer the infidels. Boy, that campaign sounds like a barrel of fun, doesn't it? <laughs> somebody who's who's opening a refrigerator and leaning in, right, is the language of a woman. Somebody who's opening the refrigerator and being cut off halfway through that lean is the voice of a, like a mermaid or a siren, right? Da, da. This is not the face of the hobby anymore. Uh, and I think there's been mistakes made in years past where people assumed that D&D players were all, you know, white dudes in a basement, um, which is which has been a faulty assumption for a lot of years and gets more and more false every day. Uh, and so it's, in my viewpoint, honestly, guys like me can't can't leave soon enough. I just had to be born with empathy and a weakness for socialism and femboys. For socialism and femboys. For socialism and femboys. We gotta put a little hot sauce on the taco, you know what I mean? We want this dwarf to be the dwarfiest dwarf. Right, right, right. We right. want the elf to be the elfiest elf. And just the dashiest dash of Tabasco. <laughs> the voices need to carry across water. I'm a creative. Um, it's a huge drain, right? Because fans can be awful. Al zurdo de mierda no le podés dar ni un pero, milímetro. Pero ¿Me podés definir zurdo de mierda? Que no todos lo los que, digamos, los colectivistas, <risa> los que ponen, digamos, o sea, esa idea. A ver, ¿Por qué es... le pones de mierda, digamos? Porque son una mierda. You Ouch. say white lives matter, they don't. White lives don't matter because white lives aren't a thing. I disagree. I disagree, Gary. Lutherville, Marina Dallas, Otisburg. Otisburg. Who's this monster back? She's got her own place. Man. Otis, man. it's a little bitty place. Otis, man. okay. I just wipe it off. That's all. It's a little town. Yep. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. Well, no. we'll do it live. Fuck it. Do it live. I can. I'll write it and we'll do it live. Fucking thing sucks. Thank you. I enjoyed having you here. You're a very good co-host. Man, your sinewy muscles are just ripped. And look how your gleaming sweat just comes off your golden body. And the women are just looking the same. And all of them want double D. I love this place. Can any of you in the chat... I didn't see if anybody did. Can any of you name uh, where that little sting comes from? Um, I'll be I'll be very impressed if uh, if any of you can. <laughs> How is everybody doing? Good. <laughs> the peanut gallery says good. <laughs> only uh, only one tonight. Uh, Boom. Yeah, Rogan had to uh, had to call off. We got our first first little uh, mouse dropping. First Ariba, super chat. Ariba. Yep, Hungar, our old friend. Two dollars. Someone got it right. Double D. Oh, really? Yep. Meat. Oh, meat. Yeah, I should have known. Meat would get it right. <laughs> um, yep, that was BKTV. Um, Dan Cortese. God, he was a phenomenon back in the day, wasn't he? He had a beautiful head of hair. I bet he did. Yeah, but man, people just hated him for, for those commercials. They were those Burger King BKTV commercials. People hated his guts for that stuff. He had a thank you, Hungar. He had a brief moment on Seinfeld. Oh, really? He, he, he was the guy that George wore his hat backwards for, and like him and they were going rock climbing, had to do a sandwiches and stuff. Like I that. can't remember that, but it, it's if he was wearing his hat backwards, yeah. that that was his whole. Yep. <laughs> that was his his vibe. Step Mer off, George. Step <laughs> off, Luke. And Luke is a hundred percent correct. Thank you, Mercurius. Second super chat. Uh, Good to see you here. Uh, good to see all of you here. Uh, already got a nice crowd. Um, yeah, so we got a little bit of stuff to cover. Uh, maybe uh, if we can get into it, uh, we'll talk about Wizards of the Coast. Uh, it was found out after the fact that uh, they 
laid off a bunch of people who were responsible in part for their physical books, uh, surprising pretty much no one. Uh, a couple of people already did videos on it. I know Pundit did and uh, Prof DM. So maybe we'll we'll look at the Prof DM video just a little bit, discuss it. Um, do you ever notice? <laughs> do, you ever, <laughs> do you ever notice when you lay off people to do books? Um, also, we can discuss um, Disney, D-E-I. Oh, my. Diversity, equity, inclusion. I guess Elon Musk got sent an internal Disney document about um, how they implement their diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, it's pretty eye-opening. Um, it will make you not want to uh, <laughs> support Disney. Maybe we'll even talk about one-to-one time. Yikes. We got anybody in the green room? The bro SR. Him. Our primary guest, we may have someone here. Look who I found. I spy with my little eye. <laughs> Greg Gillespie, how you doing, sir? Very good. How are you doing? No, not too bad. Good to Hi, see Greg. you again. Hello. Um, always a favorite in the chat, always a favorite in the channel. Um, and in our hearts. And in, yeah, no, number one on the scoreboard, number one in our hearts. Greg. Well, cheers to you guys, too. <laughs> let's not uh let's not beat around the bush why don't you tell us why you're here tonight well other than the fact that we love you and uh you know you're always welcome but uh why this particular night well <clears throat> uh culmination of a couple of years worth of work dragon slayer the role-playing game is released uh today so pdf and uh and book format and uh it's uh, been a great pretty great journey but i'm ready to let it go and uh, float into the marketplace of ideas and see how it does. Yep. And um, there is a um, there is a link in the description if you're interested in Greg's game. It's OSR, we played a little bit. I, Greg was kind enough to invite me on his um, his channel. And uh, great group of guys. Uh, we kind of went into the barrow maze a little bit and had a actually had a pretty fun time. Uh, I only missed the first session, and then uh, I think I made all the others. So. You go here. Uh, look at that beautiful. That's Jeff Easley, right? That art. That's right. Yeah, the same artist that did the uh, original AD and D Dungeon Masters Guide. If uh, people aren't familiar, most will be, I'm sure. Yep. Yep. Great artist. Um, very talented, and uh, that is a kick-ass picture. I love that. Um, so yeah, uh, consider, if you will supporting dragon slayer because um it's a cool game like i have the pdf greg again was kind enough to send me kind of an advanced copy so going through it um i really like it um you know if you're if you kind of want a little bit more than um old school essentials is you know as good as uh good as rule set as that is um if you're looking for maybe just a little bit more um this is a um good way to do that noigiadat i just ordered my copy print copy wow there you go enjoyed reading the pdf so far cool um, yeah, thank awesome. you. Uh, now, um, before we uh, get into the interview, you 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 made something. Uh, it's on your channel right now, but um, I can, I think we can show it here. Mm -hmm. um, you did a, a a nice little trailer. Um, how excited were you uh, when you saw the final product here? Because I really like this. It's it was really exciting. So I had a really clear idea of what I wanted to do <clears throat> with this and. Uh, I wanted to take like, you know, just the, the, the 2D black and white line art and kind of bring it to life a little bit and uh, bring it, uh, you know, incorporate some blue graph paper. Don't know if people notice that. And the, oh, yeah. the paper ripping, almost like you're ripping up a character sheet that just died or <laughs> whatever it may be. So, <clears throat> yeah, it was, um, it was a lot of fun to do and uh, just piecing it together and thinking about the effects and then trying to, I knew what, I knew I wanted some metal in there and make it all come together. Beautiful. Yeah, Howard Hughes, Barrow Maze means fun times and Barrow Mazes. <laughs> Good to see you here, Howard. Thank you so much. Thank you for always uh, supporting the channel. It means a lot. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, without further ado, and you can watch this on Greg's uh, YouTube channel, uh, but we will show it here too. Um, let's take a look at uh, the trailer for Dragon Slayer.
<laughs> that is awesome. Two things. Um, someone meant a comment that they've seen that street before. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And number two, I hear an echo. Uh, uh, Greg, you, we might be echo echoing through uh, something in, on your end. Uh, and number two, that sounded like it's not, but it has a Godsmack feel to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought of, Godsmack. Yeah. I, I know the street uh, that they're talking about. That was the, That's the street, I believe, of Emerald the Chaotic, correct? And Rose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. just, a little, just a little homage, a little tip of the cap. Doesn't mean uh, other things haven't happened on that street. So... Um, <laughs> That's the way I looked at it. It's the street of broken dreams, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so, you know, one of the things that I think, there's a couple homages that people probably won't be aware of. So my academic, one of my first academic books called Hunting for Empire, which was uh, the revision of my PhD dissertation into book form, the cover was black and white with red lettering. <clears throat> so you see that come forward here a little bit. So it really stands out. I always like that. And, um, you know, uh, Gary Gygax, his initials were Egg, Ernest Gary Gygax. And it just so happens that mine are G-E-G. -E -G. Um, oh, yeah. So the synergy of that I liked on the back of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the Dungeon Master on top of the D6. Yeah, the, um, well, that's, that's great about the initials. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but that's, that's really cool. The the black and red, um, yeah. It's, it seems to me that's that's kind of an '80s thing, doesn't it? It seems like they they did like credit like movie credits, uh, red on black. I could never read it even as a kid, but uh, it looks so cool, you know. Especially here, uh, you know, as we see the uh, you know the logo and uh, the the word mark. God, that you do everything. I will say top notch. Uh, the trailer, the uh, graphic design, the artwork. Um, you do not scrimp. Um, that is a compliment. Uh, well, I appreciate it. And, you know, the thing is, like, if it gets me, I want to be fired up. And I want to be fired up. And if I'm fired up, then I think that other people who like the same kind of games that we play will also be fired up. And this is the time to be fired up. It's a 50th anniversary of the game. Um, you know, where I, I was saying on a Facebook uh, group today, um, we're, just, we're torch bearers. Like, it, it's Gary Gygax's game. It's him we're celebrating. It's his game. We're just bearing the torch for the time that, that we can while while we uh, we're, while we're able, and that's really what it's all about. It's important for folks like you, especially you know, but even me in my own small way, you know, with the channel and you know others. I know, uh, you know, Bill, Sylvie, Dungeon Delver. You know, we, we got to almost keep Gary's name out there and alive because, as we know, the company that should be you know, <laughs> keeping his name alive has no interest in doing that. Uh, quite the opposite. I can't agree with you more. And I mean, you know, uh, if, if I had control of Dungeons and Dragons, this is kind of what it would look like. But uh, I'll just do my little part and tuck in my little corner of the OSR. And for the people who say, you know, you, you, you see these um, YouTube videos and nonsense articles about you know, oh, is the OSR alive or is it dead or whatever? Well, you watch the trailer and you tell me how dead that is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> alive and well, uh, for yeah. sure. I, I still, I'm still getting conflicted feelings about that, that Lamia. <laughs> I think it is the, the bare breasted <laughs> issue. Yeah. Very confused thoughts. Uh, it's, it's good artwork uh, to, to do that to a person. <laughs> What's the, uh, what does the chat say here? By the way, uh, if any, uh, if Cal, if you're here, if Frank Avina is here, uh, let me know. Um, you too, Crazy Mouse, because I've not seen it so far. Yeah, because he won the uh, Mad Scribe magazine last week. I have not. I did not hear from him. I got patties off to him, um, but I did uh, did not see Frank's email. So I don't know if he uh, lost it. But if he's in the chat here, uh, step forward, and uh, we will make it right. Uh, yeah, it seems like everybody uh, thought that that trailer was really, really. Uh, really cool um and people are talking about the color combo looks really nice oh yeah yeah like i said it it takes you to that era in my mind and maybe i'm just, maybe i'm just a minority but i see black on red and i i think 80s uh, for some reason um let's see chris miller yeah the chris miller you got it emerald the the chaotic too yeah anybody everybody remembers that uh one of the uh one of the big badasses of uh old school D D. um you sent me a um, a video 
and it was somebody just kind of breaking down what what OSR meant, almost on a uh, technical level. But like, what what does old school OSR mean to you? Do you look at it more as kind of like a uh, like a like a feeling? Or is it just something mechanical, like you need to do this to be OSR? Or is it just you can change certain things, but you're still OSR? How do you view that on the continuum? Well, I, I, I'm more perhaps narrow in my approach than a lot of other people would be. Um, to be OSR means to be compatible with TSR Dungeons & Dragons. So uh, that includes you know all the mechanical parts of it, descending AC, um, hit dice is 1d8 unless otherwise stated. There are some fundamental assumptions about how the game is played in that in the TSR context. That's the first part. And then the second part is how it plays and how it feels. So if it feels more low fantasy, um, if it's more tomb robberish than um, than heroes engaging in world changing events, it's probably in the line of TSR d and I'm not of the opinion that something that uses 5e rule sets, that poaches the aesthetic of old school D&D is itself old school d and I just don't buy that argument at all. So now that doesn't mean if somebody wants to do that and wants to create that game and, and do whatever, that's up to them. But it's not OSR to me personally. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't have as open a definition as some do, but that doesn't mean that my definition is right and their definition is wrong. And I think at the end of the day, as I said at the outset, the marketplace of ideas will decide over time whether something is good enough on its own merit or it's not. And I think you're, you're, it's dangerous to hitch your wagon to any WotC mechanic at this stage. I think it's foolish. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's, fool, it's foolish. Real quick, Bath Y'all Games, uh, do you get a PDF version with the hardcover? Yeah, that's right. Cool. There you go. He, want to know, he knows that that's that, but he wants to know if it's a limited time. Oh no, no. Um, okay. But nor- normally, uh, I haven't looked at it in a while, but uh, in the past, I've, I've thrown in the, the the PDF if you buy the yeah. the hardcover for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's kind of in industry standard. And uh, let's face it. I mean, we know. Look, we know people can can put it out there, and uh, it can get pirated day one. But you're also dealing with. I would I would just say folks in our sphere want to support. <laughs> You know, people who are doing the the kind of work you do. So, uh, you know. I, yeah, well, there, I, I, there are the, the silly the silly uh, people who don't want to see any conservative creator succeed will go take your stuff immediately and put it up wherever wherever they can because they're trying to undercut you. But um, even if I like, even if I never made another dollar, it's not going to stop me from creating the things I want to create. Yeah. Um, and so, like, it's it's about. Um, it, it, because I'm coming of a place of a, of a creative, I want to nurture these ideas and then I want to give them form and then I want to make them presentable in a way for other people to play. And uh, that's a, that's what it is at the end of the day. And there, there's, um, I don't, I'm not much of a knee bender. So there's that. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. And like I said, that, yeah, th- those folks will put it out there, but Anybody who, you know, takes advantage of it, A, I guess it's a compliment if, you know, if they're, you know, if people are downloading it, but those are the people that probably wouldn't have paid anyway. Like I said, people will go out of their way to support, you know, folks like you. And uh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, know it's funny. Just- I mean, uh, just to jump in there, um, a while ago, Eric Tankard did a video where, um, where he showed screenshots of a group where they uh, thrashed me on the regular. Um, but also acknowledge that they play my games. So I guess they're, I guess they're not all bad. It's the biggest compliment you can get, right? <laughs> yes. Somebody doesn't like you personally, but uh, you know they still they think, still support your work. Yeah, exactly. Um, have you ever had? Because I know Kickstarter, you do Kickstarter, and um, you know I know a lot of the like the Comics Gate folks. Uh, some of them don't like Kickstarter at all, um, and some some do. You know, some haven't had problems, and obviously you haven't had. I would say you probably haven't had any big issues. Um, have they ever like done anything to you to kind of mess with you, even in a, in a little way? Uh, not on Kickstarter. In other ways, yes. But um, you know, Kickstarter does lean left. Um, it's no no shock. Uh, so uh, I don't um, 
but I don't, uh, my games are not uh, political. They're good games. So if you're, you can't tell me, for example, if you look through Barrow Maze or you look through Dwero Deep um, or Archaea or Hypel and say, say there's um, an, an explicit politic driving the gaming, driving the narrative, that's not, that's not a reasonable criticism. Um, and at this point, given the, well, 500,000 words of gaming that I've put out, that, that um, an evidence-based approach does not support that position whatsoever. It's just not, it's, it's, that's just um, nonsense coming from people who don't like you based on your individual um, worldview. That's all that is. Yeah, it's like grow, grow up. I mean, like, like you said before, you know, you if the product is good, you can even still play it. You know, even if you don't like the person. Uh, Muffin Man uh, says here he's getting the physical copy of Dragon Slayer. Good for you. Uh, I think you'll probably be pleased with that. But he's considering getting an adventure as well. One, probably one of your uh, mega dungeons, aside from Barrow Maze, which he owns already. Uh, which one do you recommend? Do you have a, a, a f best of the rest? Well, um, I, probably my favorites would be uh, Barrow Maze first, and then Dwarity would be a very close second, might even compete like a 1B, uh, because I enjoy playing dwarves. I, I, dwarven fighters, dwarven clerics, that's my jam. So um, I really was excited to make a dwarven-themed uh, adventure. And, of course, uh, tucking in very neatly to that interstice between um, D&D and J.R. Tolkien's Moria, was something that it was a joy to do. Like it, it was just really super fun. And then the poster map for Twitter Deep is something that, um, you know, it, it, it to get the get the electronic copy and then take that to like a print service and get it printed off eighteen by twenty four. Because then you're really going to see all the cool detail. And it uses the same. If you played the D the Drow series back in the day, it uses the same subterranean hex crawling logic. So if you're familiar with that, then wow. that map will make a lot of sense to you. Yeah, and it's like I, you know, obviously as a DM, you're never, you're never there. I think to force anything, you know, on on your group. But um, you know, I, I have you. You were kind enough to send me a, a copy of uh, of Dwarrow Deep too, and um, it is really, it is really cool. And uh, let's just say if you know, if if there's a desire to head up north in our world to the mountains, <laughs> the the lonely mountains, the the five peaks, etc. It will be there to be explored. So <laughs> we shall see. Looks like we, oh, geez, James. Jiminy Grant. Christmas. James. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah. yeah Our soundboard's <laughs> not available tonight. So, yes. James Gang, I did it for you. DMG, next drink is on me, bros. Uh, James, by the way, I'm, I'm going to do something here. Um, one second. If, uh, if for some reason you want to uh, come in here, you know, even just to say hi. Um, I put the uh, link in the chat, or anybody else. Um, if if you're if you're set up, if you want to ask Greg a question, um, you'll see the uh, the streamyard link in there. Um, yeah, you're always uh, welcome, uh, James. Good to see you. Twenty dollars. That is very kind. And, very um, nice. Thank yes, you. Yes, have drinks and uh, perhaps something to eat. I was going to say drinks and wings, but uh, that, that ain't going to get you wings anymore. <laughs> so, Whoa, we got Hungar hit it up. Hungar. You got it. Got I got it. Brother is which one? I think Hungar might be older. Maybe Hungar might be. A, yeah, my brother is cool. Yes, he is. James is in. Yep. Oh, James is in. Yeah. Aha. Before I we get gotcha. to James, before we get to James, Chris Miller wants the Crazy Mouse beatbox soundboard. <laughs> crazy Mouse beatbox. <laughs> I actually, uh, I shaved today and I shaved my head, except oh, nice. the top. Nice. How you doing? I Whoa, love Hungar's in. Oops, sorry, right. I need. We know to we, I'm being the boomer. No, we have the uh, we have the James brothers here. So, uh, um, do you guys have a uh, have a question for uh, Mr. Gillespie? No, I'm going to take off after I just say I have the uh, Mega Dungeon set in the swamp. And I absolutely that? love it. It's actually on my homebrew world. I put that town and the swamp. I mean, he I love your work, man. You do you do good work, even though right now I'm like obsessed with Dragon Bane. And yeah. also I pre-ordered the physical copy, so hopefully 
Um, that'll be good, you know. Right now, yeah. I'm plus E for D and D because it's just so easy to. Yeah. Like, He's the oldest. Yeah, I'm that hunger by the oldest. fourteen months. Oh, really? Okay, <laughs> nice. Yeah, nice. my mother no, had <laughs> all of her children like thirteen months apart. Which uh, which mega dungeon was set in the swamp, Greg? Which which one are they referring to? I think it's Barabin. Uh, Barabin, yeah. So uh, Helix. Oh, that, oh that's Barabin. Okay. Yeah. So Helix has a, has a double homage. So the first part is that um, it's mentioned in the cartoon series, and then the other part is there's an obscure '80s Canadian heavy metal band called Helix, and uh, so you can YouTube them, and uh, they had they were like a one hit wonder, and so um, they're uh, their metal um, font is similar to to the Helix font I have in Barrymore. It's just a little tip of the cap to 80s metal. Look them up I'm on YouTube. We did. I'm and definitely going to cool. have to look into Dwarf Deep because, like you, I too love dwarves and anything having to do with Moria. I know, right? And Hungar I, always plays a dwarf in every game. I am a dwarf. <laughs> but, uh, you but got I'm the gonna, look, buddy. I'm, I'm going to let the show get going. I am going to show this off to... Uh, Ooh. Yeah, I, I have a knight army now, Mr. Ooh. W. Ooh, that is sweet. These are my, my, my uh, armagers, but I have four uh, actual knights. He's copying me. I started it off with my own <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. that's true. But anyway, yeah, I left the top long and just shaved it off. <laughs> well, it looks great, buddy. I, li I like it. <laughs> so, hey, thanks for awesome. having me on. Uh, peace and love, guys. Yeah. I'm going to be too, an old buddy. man and probably go to bed. Me and <laughs> my okay. brother on at the same time on double D. This oh, is like yeah, a yeah. true. <laughs> and if you're going to buy drinks, make sure they're yingling. Absolutely. Yingling. Absolutely, yep. Yep, it's our home state, so absolutely. Sure. <laughs> <Thanks for> Jake. <laughs> I'm going to bounce too. I was just excited to, for a chance to be on your show because oh. you're my favorite YouTuber. Although I'm your favorite YouTube channel. That's, uh, absolutely. <laughs> you and Razor Fist, uh, you're, you guys are you guys are tied. You're now officially tied, buddy. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm part of the old, I'm part of the old school group group now. Oh really? You said so last week. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, your stuff is really great. My brother is my DM 90% of the time. So when he ran us through that dungeon or the freaking super swap thing in his world that you wrote, it was like crazy style. But yeah, your work is great. I've, I've read through a lot of it and keep doing what you do, man, because it makes us nerds and I am the king of the nerds, according to the chat. Um, it makes us happy. <laughs> It, it gives us something to do. We get to throw around some math rocks and have fun. Yeah, that's what it's all about. So, party on, guys. Double D, cool. thanks, brother. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Hungar. Take care, brother. Love Bye, you. Bye, Hungar. Yep, we'll see you, man. Um, yeah, they, they said swamp, and I, I, my mind wasn't making the connection. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Barrow Maze was a swamp. Although, when I ran it, like the swamp had fall, pretty much fallen. Uh, you know, not that it was completely uh, dried out, but uh, it, was, it was very. Uh, Let's see. Uh, um, don't uh, yeah. Put the. Uh, here we go. Just trying to look here to see if anybody else uh, wants in. Don't think so. Um, yeah. So that's uh, obviously high praise. I haven't met anybody who's either ran Barrow Maze or played at it and really had a cross word to say about it. I mean, I'm sure you have. Just but it's probably just haters, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the thing is that it depends on, you know, what you enjoy most. Like for me, I think that um, Dungeons and Dragons is best when it's simple, um, when it's popcorn game-ish, but has enough of that depth, you know, where you want it to be, um, but doesn't bog down play at the table. And then, um, and then when the scenarios are, are relatively simple and straightforward, the game isn't um, forcing a narrative on you rather the narrative of emerges from the players at the table and mm -hmm. and when when you have when that happens you get buy into the game and then all of a sudden players just start it just takes on a life of its own and that's when you know you've got a good game when um, players are taking the reins in the sandbox and saying yeah this is this is where we want to go this is what we want to do and you throw in some hooks and off they go 
let me uh, let me set let me uh, set one up for you here. Um, so you're writing an adventure. You want you want to write an adventure. Do you uh, do you do the uh, read out loud text boxes? <laughs> no, I don't. Um, so <laughs> now <clears throat> let's be be clear about this part. So. Like if you think back in the day when you're playing like Dragonlance modules or you know whatever it may be, you'd be sort of like sitting there, you'd half be paying attention, the DM would be reading it, probably monotone, right? And you would just be like zoning it. And you're probably not making eye contact with the DM either. And that's really key. Like this is a game between human beings. We wanna be making eye contact. We wanna be talking to each other. We want to feel the place come out through the DM's um, enthusiasm. And I just feel like if you're reading, not a lot of people can read text and bring it to life. And sometimes writers and designers can't write text to be brought to life. So there's there's opportunities for it to go wrong. If I was going to write like a, a, a standard TSR 32 pager, which I'll probably try my hand at in the, in the uh, short term, uh, I, I would consider using some box text, but I, I do believe if you avoid the box text, it forces you as the writer and designer to be very succinct. You have to give the DM what they need in that moment and, and then be able to get out of it and convey it to players. So I think there's different ways of thinking through it, and I, I prefer not. And I, I agree too, you know, and I, I kind of caught on pretty quick, you know, cause you, you do, you had the right of it when it's like, oh, you know, you're, you're having this conversation, like, what do you want to do here? And everything's fine. And then all of a sudden you go into a room and then the DM puts his head down and you enter a room, you know, which is uh 30 by 30, you know, it has dazzling, you know, gems. And it's like, <laughs> you can tell already, like it just kind of saps the, yeah, you know, the, the, all the energy out. Um, that happens if you play in like convention games too. Like that, I've been in some pretty bad convention games where, yeah, the DM just literally put his head down, and you know we're all we're all kind of chuckling. But um, but yeah, mm -hmm. you're better off just kind of skimming it honestly, and and just talking. You know, even if it's a little Spartan at first, and even if you miss something and you have to reread it and go, oh yeah, by the way, you know there is something over here. You know, now you now see it. It's better than just literally just reading out loud. It's it's the yeah. worst form of DMing you could do. Uh, Agreed. Far. And there's two other notes I would add to that. So the first would be I really enjoy vanilla medieval fantasy. I don't want weird campaign settings. I don't want overly weird classes. I don't want weird races. I don't want I don't mind some weirdness in monsters, but not Gonzo weird. And so 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 I think that is central to the game. Uh, as um, central to the OSR style game. So that, that would be the first part. And then don't get, make sure you're based in medieval fantasy. Don't be fantastical. And uh, are there opportunities? Yes, but I'm talking like a grounded, a grounded game, something that's based. And uh, without the base, it, it just has things floating, you know, here and there. So that's one of the reasons, you know, why I, I, you know, went to Ireland and, and went to a lot of barrel mounds and stuff to make sure that the material I'm doing is based in, in real life experiences. I want to feel being there. And then it's from that position, excuse me, that I can convey that um, in writing. So not everyone can do that. And and it's something that I wanted to do. And, and it will definitely come out in, in uh, future future work. Jeff Hatch uh, has a question here. Uh, can you explain exactly how these folks are going to get their physical copies? It's, go, it's working through drive through right? Yeah, working through drive through So if um, if you were involved in the Kickstarter or joined afterwards, those will be sent out. If they haven't been sent out, they'll be sent out tomorrow. And then uh, from there, it'll be uh, on drive through um, One other thing that ran through my mind as you were speaking <clears throat> there is the, um, oh, um, Oh, something else that's really central to the game as I like to play it is procedural dungeon crawling. And you got a, a good sense of that through through the um, the Dragon Slayer sessions that we played together. So there, there's a procedure to keeping player characters alive when you're dungeon crawling. And um, it, it's the, I want to reward the attentive, creative, ingenious player. 
Um, and and the players that aren't that way end up dying. Um, player characters end up dying, and that's the way it should be, right? The conscientious player survives, and the ones that throw caution to the wind <laughs> normally die on a long enough timeline. If you think about our game, Stern and Mrs. Double D always survive. Yeah. Late, late, lately. Yep. And Rogan, <laughs> it's not yeah. so much. Well, a lot of these guys, they'll choose to be frontline fighters and they're first in, in first combat. In. And yeah. like, like Greg has said, you know, time and again, um, you know, don't give me an excuse to kill you, you know, because I, because I will. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to get the, real, real quick here, Howard Hughes. Yeah, I thought this was in Ben Stein's voice. You enter a room, <laughs> you see anyone, anyone. <laughs> Bueller, got, Bueller, Bueller, yeah, <laughs> very good, Howard. Um, yeah, that that idiot L said I sounded like Ben Stein. Uh, I, I ran into him on another stream. <laughs> like you that think you sound like Ben yeah. Stein? Yeah, I said you think that's an insult? I, said, I just I take watched, that as a high compliment. I just watched <laughs> Honeymoon in Vegas where he has a like a small little role at an airport. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's at, he's at the uh, desk. Doesn't yes, uh, doesn't exactly. Nicholas Cage go ape shit on him? Yes. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Crazy mouse. You're not even game flying game. today. <laughs> but Double D, I mean, you, in playing in my game, you were cautious. You were, like, staying out of the fray. I mean, you're playing your role. Well, you know, I, I also kind of wanted to take a step back, you know, let let those other boys shine. I was there as a, I knew I wanted to be a support person, you know, uh, just chipping that, in every once in a while. That was your class role. Yeah. Hmm. Yep, ex exactly. It's, uh, and I had a good time. Um, you know, I like the monk. Um I tried to do, I tried to work in some of the things that you know because this is a new monk you know this isn't the uh, kung fu monk you know this is a western monk you know so you had things in there like chanting to kind of ward away evil you know <laughs> all kinds of evil or you know to, to help at least so I wanted to do a little of that you know and uh, you wanted me to use my staff a little bit more but I I wanted to use that damn mace didn't I. <laughs> Well, I mean, there are advantages to using the staff, so there's yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, I know. I, I saw those, but I'm like, I still want to use the mace. <laughs> so if you're playing a monk, use the damn staff. Uh, that, that comes from uh, from Greg himself. What's, if you were playing your own game, what would you choose as your, uh, your favorite class? What would you <clears throat> play with? Mm. Well, I kind of, as I said, I like to play dwarves, and uh, I also like to play religious zealot clerics, like um, the the ones who just believe that their their version of God is the only one that's available, and all the other one, everyone else is a heathen. I think that's funny to me. And um, <clears throat> one of our our players actually was playing a bit that way, which was fun. Um, and, you know, I haven't rolled a paladin in decades, so. <laughs> Um, you know, I like I like the lawful good cleric, lawful good paladin, dwarven fighter cleric. Those are my sweet spots. How about you? It's it's weird because when I did play way back in the day, I kind of leaned towards the cleric too. Um, I, I didn't mind it. Um, I liked kind of being a support person with a little bit of punch. You know, they they mm -hmm. do make they do give clerics a little bit of punch. You know, for yeah. combat and um, you know nowadays I would probably just take the simpler just because. Just I got a lot on my mind, you know. So it's like I'm just a fighter is is real good, and uh, you know we'll we'll see how he can do. I'm, I'm going to spitball something for you, and don't don't be afraid to say it's insane because I was I discussed this at the table. Uh, was it last week about the cleric? Holy moly! <laughs> this was met with crossed arms, <laughs> yeah. and I thought someone was going to quit. My wife, my wife's playing the cleric in in our group. She's a you know a sister, you know a very good character actually. Um, I mm -hmm. think the leader of our group. Yeah, yeah, she is the leader, uh, probably for the first time. Um, but uh, I was just spitballing here, you know. Look, I'm not like an idea, idea guy, but sometimes I'll just go on flights of fancy, as it were. So I was just thinking, all right, if let's say um, the Vancean system is good. I don't think it's perfect. I'm willing, you know, I'll always to accept it, of course, just because, look, it's what we grew up with. You know, it's like comfort food, right? Um <clears throat> But I, I was just kind of talking out loud to Crazy Mouse and uh, Rogan and a couple other people before our game Friday. And I'm like, what if I said it's it's just not very to me, I don't know, for lack of a better word, like c either cinematic or even literary, just to kind of go over and put your hands on someone in the middle of combat, say you're good now, and then all of a sudden you're healed up. Now, I understand this is a game, you know, so there has to be mechanics in the game, you know. 
in in some respects it is a little bit of a chess match you know when you're in you're in battle but i just i was just saying out loud like you know if not if i had my druthers but what if you hey, gave hey guys how do you feel about yeah how do you feel about giving the cleric die 12 hit die he is a tank he or she is a tank and they can certainly cast healing magic but whatever and i know there's versions of this but whatever ma- whatever damage they heal they assume onto themselves it's almost like there's like a transference of like you know like oh, I'm, a, I'm i'm taking that damage out of you and I'm, I'm bringing it into me and then maybe you know they have a little bit more advanced healing like after the combat mm-hmm. i don't know Greg's probably thinking like, oh man, it was the gayest idea ever. Mrs. Mrs. Double <laughs> Mrs. D, D was like, put her. He, she crossed her arms and she said, "I hate it." Yeah, she's like, "Then I'm not healing." And then she also said, "And I'm not healing anybody." I'm going, "Whoa!" I said, "We're not implementing this." I and said, then I was I'm going to roll up a new. And then this. she said, "I'm going to roll up a new character." Yeah, yeah. She's like, "Well, I'll just roll up and I'm like, ah, oh, dear. All right, I guess I'm sleeping on the couch tonight." <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the only way you could really do that is if you did something similar with the magic user, because it has to be reasonable. And of course, you've got half the hit points. So now, now you're really yeah. putting the crunch. So I would say uh, I'd, I'd be open to the discussion, but but how do you balance the magic user and the illusionist vis-a-vis the cleric or the druid? Yeah. And and so th- those would be considerations uh, for me. Yeah. And it, it probably wouldn't fit into a true, like you said, your your definition of an OSR game. It just it just wouldn't wouldn't fit. Um, well, but, fancy know. magic, fancy magic as it's played in Dungeons Dragons is really technology. It, it's an on off switch most of the time. It's working or it's not right. working. Yeah, there might be a little bit of variable if you have a random table inside a spell or something like that, which I like to do just because it provides makes make spells a little bit more interesting at the table, but. Uh, it, that's a, a thought, you know, as well. So something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it's something you could maybe discuss, maybe like a near OSR game, you know, maybe something like a castles and crusades or something like that. That's maybe not quite OSR by definition, but you know, is, you know, maybe within shouting distance or something like that, you could try something like that in or, you know, anything else, but uh, I don't know. I always like to think about stuff like that. Not because I think I'm smarter, than you know the people who did it but i'm just always thinking of i don't know like new angles oh would this be interesting sure. you know to do yeah so, well you should be i mean and if you have your nose and the stuff long enough that's exactly how we all think right but yeah we're not talking about people like us or the folks in the chat we're talking about the people who just show up to say their monthly or twice a month game they right. don't read forums they don't read deep you know gaming stuff in social media they're busy doing other things. They just show up to their game. And for those people, spells as technology is what they want. They want to know magic missile is magic missile. They want to know sleep is sleep or whatever it may be. And so you have to keep in mind um, the people the people that are engaged in the broader discussion like we are here aren't necessarily the majority of people you're writing and designing for. So, and it's a balance between, well, this is getting a little bit stale, but those people that only show up with their game once a month, they're going to be expecting this, right? So you're thinking both ways. Yeah, you kind of have to compromise a little bit. You know, I'd like to do more, but, you know, I also want to, I also want to sell this to, you know, to, you know, the, the majority of players. Like you said, a lot of them just, they have no idea of this world that we live in, this, you know, terminally kind of online, you know, fighting with you know, really <laughs> dumb people. So uh, speaking of that, um, there's a couple of things we're going around on Twitter. I wanted your uh, your two cents on, Mr. Gold. Yeah, I've been I've been watching some of this stuff, and I, I some of it I just shake my head. It's like, what are people doing? Well, first off, is this weird debate, and I don't know who it came from or where it came from. I know who picked up the ball and you know ran with it, and um, it's the same person who, if we have time, we'll you know we'll talk about the other thing too. Um, but it's turned into a how uh, Robert E. Howard v- versus uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, and I think it's one of these situations. And it's I see it mostly on Twitter. It was kind of going around this week, and I'm like, what is all this? It seems like there's you know very vocal fans, especially of Tolkien. You know, maybe he just because he's been around, and you know, just his stuff is just maybe you know a little bit more popular. Um, his fans can be very vocal. 
And I think what happened is maybe one or two of them, you know, kind of <laughs> disrespected Robert E. Howard or, you know, I don't know, maybe who they thought were the typical Robert E. Howard fans. So next thing you know, it's like J.R. Tolkien sucks. And, uh, you know, Robert E. Howard is the <laughs> is the only true, uh, <laughs> you know, fantasy writer. And I'm like, well, are, are you still allowed to like both? Because uh, they both scratch very different itches. But, uh, you know, I, I still have immensely enjoyed you know, all of the, all of their work. Uh, would you pick one? Do you think that debate is really dumb? Uh, where do you come down on that? Well, for me, I see it. <clears throat> I see fiction or TV or film or uh, role playing games as a scene. And in that scene, there's all there's different ways of doing things. And, it, you know, it's just like if you're into like uh, a rock band scene or heavy metal scene or whatever, you like something that's maybe a little bit softer and something that's super hardcore. Uh, but they're both within a certain set of parameters for you. So they're both in that set of parameters for me. And, and here, here's how you know. If you find one inspiring, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. So, you know, if you want maybe a little bit more action, you're going to lean one way. If you're going to want a, a bit more sweeping material, you're going to lean another. Um, so, you know, there's that. And, uh, so that that's probably how I would I would go about it. And and you know, speaking of scenes, um the 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 level zero uh, excuse me, session zero um stuff makes no sense to me at all. Like, so for example, if if you're going to tune into uh Star Wars or you're gonna tune into Game of Thrones, do we need episode one to be well, there are mature themes, and these <laughs> themes consist of A, B, C, and D. Is everybody okay with those themes? Are you outside your mind? Like, just outside your mind. So yeah. talk about ruining the experience you're about to have. How about you suspend disbelief, engage in what's about to happen, and have a little bit of an escapism and fun rolling dice with your friends? Um, so, you know, that that part of the scene I don't understand, and I'll never understand it. I just think it's for, it's just not not for me. Yeah. And, and I think it's, I think it's painfully boring, and it steals the thunder of what you're about to experience if you're giving way. Is everybody okay if you start off as slaves? Is everybody okay if the pixies get their wings pulled off? I mean, really, really. Well, the world we're living in here. Um... It's it's a lot different than it was 20, 25 years ago where people had sort of a reflexive respect for authority. And, um, you know, not that the DM is, you know, like a huge authority figure, but at the table, he is the authority. And um, if anything's been painfully clear over the last, you know, like I said, you know, 20 years or so, it's just eroded to where, well, now everybody has a voice. And I understand that, that there is some good in that because it's helped us kind of expose things and people that needed to be exposed. But, but in the same respect, it's also, uh, let's just say uh, <laughs> low self-esteem is, is not the problem that, that people think it is. Uh, there are people who are going around claiming they have low self-esteem and uh, <laughs> they, they are the most... Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what, what to call them. Um, but they think they know everything. And I think this is catering to those folks. Like you need to come to us so we can bless, you know, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're playing with friends, you are like, and I've heard some people say like, hey, I have something akin to a session zero. We just go over and talk about like, oh yeah, we're going to be playing in this world. You know, you know, who, who wants to be, you know, what character. I, that's different than I think what we're talking about here. A session zero, when you put a label on it, I think it is for what you were saying. Um, it's for, you know, is this okay? We're gonna be discussing these themes, you know. Um, if it's just a powwow, you know, that's that's completely different. Chris Miller, $10. <laughs> but, but Greg, how do you expose who is, isn't a fascist in your game? <laughs> who gets the highest social credit score? Very yeah, good question, right. Chris. Yeah, ten dollars. Yeah, you, you get. Yeah, if you, we play to a certain point, you get debanked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, well, you're up in Canada. You can get your assets frozen, right? Yeah, that is true. Just, just like the uh, the poor truckers did. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're a cautionary tale. Just be advised. Yeah, Adam Carolla has this thing, and uh, I think he's uh, he's bang on. He says, just look at what Canada's doing. Mm-hmm. And he said, in about five or ten years, that's where places like California, Oregon, and Washington those types of places. That's where they want to be. So you guys are sort of driving the bus up there, unfortunately, except for, I guess, Alberta. I think Alberta is probably what, one of the only, only places of, uh, <laughs> that's trying to fight back. Is yeah, that, they're, is actually, it, they're, they're the only province that is actively uh, active. Like um, active is the key word. Uh, mm-hmm. Taking it on socially, taking it on legally, um, you know, establishing their terrain and their territory. And they have every right to do that. We are, um, form of confederation is very decentralized. So, um, and just in case people aren't aware, uh, the um, cultivation of natural resources is a power of the provinces. Uh, but because we have all these um, ag- uh, globalist climate agendas, our federal government's trying to impose that onto provinces, but they just don't have that power. They're trying to anyway, like they try to influence post-secondary education and tenor of other uh, social institutions on which they have no legal power over whatsoever, but they're, they're good at doing it. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. And Alberta is uh, very, obviously very oil rich, right? Um, so they very should... natural, uh, full of natural resources for sure. That's the Biden's first act was to cancel the pipeline that was to come down directly to the United States so we could help each other be energy self-sufficient. So you don't have to buy your, your power uh, from uh, from dictators and and yeah. um, Saudi people Arabia. that mean anti democratic countries. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, hopefully, um, I don't know how much longer Trudeau has, but uh, hopefully, we take care of this problem here. And can't come soon enough. Uh, nine months or so. Did you see where um, Biden was giving a speech and he uh, said that he had just met with uh, Francois Mitterrand? <laughs> He was giving a speech, I think, in Europe, and he's like, yeah, I met with President Mitterrand. He's like, of Germany. Oh, um, I mean, France, which is good. I mean, he, he got the country right. Unfortunately, Francois Mitterrand died in 1996. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I read that. And I'm like, Francois Mitterrand. I'm like, he was the president of France when I was growing up. I'm like, what the hell? Okay, I, we just, I can't imagine four more years of that, like where he's going to be mentally. It's almost cruel. I don't, cruel. Like, I don't like him or his... I don't like him as a politician, you know, I don't know him as a person, you know, whatever, but it's, it's almost cruel to the man to put him in this to position, keep wheeling him out there to be yeah. humiliated like that. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, is confused now in five more years. Oh my Lord. Yeah. It's be- um, it's good for the world order for America to have a strong foreign policy and it's not good for the world to have a weak president and a weak foreign policy. And it's just, Stating the obvious, I, any any person, whether um, you're like me, I'm very much pro uh, American. Um, but the, the people that uh, that don't speak pro American can't say that the world is better off where we are now versus where we were a few years ago. Would you? Are there ever any? Is there a set of circumstances where you would try to emigrate here? Absolutely. If things got too bad. Mm-hmm. Have, yeah. you, have you been thinking about it? I mean, are you? I have. Yeah, I can't really move until I retire. Um, but as soon as that happens and everything's possible, we'd love to have you. It's, it's, like I said, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make that trade any day of the week to get someone like you down here. Um, yeah, we can get some of these, uh, some of these lunatics who, uh, always say if Trump gets elected, I'm moving to, you know, wherever, you know, they, they can hit the bricks and, uh, they can move up to Canada and, uh, you know, make, make Canada terrible again. Yeah. Well, we're already terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was talking off. Uh, so the the Howard um, just circling back, yeah, the Howard Tolkien thing. It looks like the chat is kind of on board too. Like it, it's just really dumb. Well, there's one particular sect, and I, I think we a lot of us know who it is. It's you know old Je- Jeffro and the the Bro SR who keep things lively, I guess, if nothing else. And that's that's where I first noticed it. Um, probably just looking for attention. Uh, but there's also one other thing that I kind of circled back to. Um, and maybe it's just because he he jumped on my radar for some reason. So, uh, but I started to like get back into the uh, one-to-one time. Yes. 
Yeah, which you're familiar with. Uh, what is one to one time with you? You know, for you, and um, you know, would you do it? Have you done it? Do you do it? Um, talk about one to one time in role playing games. Okay, so <clears throat> time is always shifting in role playing games, and this is one of the things that was never explained. Gygax never explained well to you know to uh, no one's a bigger Gygax fanboy than I am, but let's just state the obvious: time was never really done well. So when we're dungeon crawling, time's happening one-to-one. -one. If uh, players end up doing something that takes time, we do that in 10-minute increments. They want to search. They want to do whatever. Then time would not advance, uh, not be one-to-one. -one, it would advance 10-to-one. -one. And then um, if you're resting, that's also going to be 10 minutes, right? And then so you're marking things in turns or 10-minute increments. Um, and uh, the DM conveys to players when things are happening one-to-one -one or when you reach a 10-minute mark or when something takes 10 minutes. Now, so then when uh, I don't let my players camp out in the dungeon, we can come back to that. Let's say they, come, they finish an adventure like we did when we played online. They go back to town. From there, uh, normally what we do is time is happening each day one-to-one -one while we're not playing. So if players want to go and um, uh, consult the local wizard, they want to find a guide to the swamp, they want to uh, uh, have something made by the local blacksmith, then you can carouse for that kind of thing uh, in a game chat that's happening, say if you don't play for a week or you don't play for two, whatever it may be. And then players have to afford themselves, have, have enough gold to afford themselves and their lodging when they're, when they're uh, out of game. <clears throat> So back in the day when we were kids, um, you just say, okay, well, we're going to wrap up. We'll just freeze the game right in the middle of dungeon crawling, and we'll pick it right up there when we left off. But you can't really do that one-to-one -one outside of, of the game, because if, if, you, if you do, you're looking at two random monster checks, um, you know, in the span of, uh, you know, uh, every other turn effectively mm -hmm. that's a lot of random monster checks if you're not playing for seven days like it's an extraordinary number of random monster checks no no i don't even know high level adventures that could possibly get a completed rest you'd have so many rests interrupted it wouldn't make sense so i don't um think that so so to answer your question time is happening subject to what you're doing if you're either freezing time when you wrap up a game if you and it, that makes sense if you have exactly the same players every week, perhaps. But I think it's cooler to force players to leave the dungeon than have them because they always want to do things in town of one type or another, research spells, whatever it may be. And then you can carouse that kind of thing. Dragon Slayer has some rules where you can do that. Um, and then um, I, and then it provides depth of game outside of actually playing at the table. Yep. So that's how I would approach it personally. How about you? Yeah, I, I get that, you know, and I'm, people think like, my, my, I was hung up on the fact that, look, maybe we can only meet, you know, this night. And so-and-so, look, somebody gets an emergency call. The babysitter, you know, got sick or something. They have to go. Yeah. Well, guys, we have to cut, we have to cut the game off right here. Hmm. Um, and I think it would just be understood like, oh, okay, you know what, emergency situation, you know, you guys don't have time to go back to, you know, wherever. Because um, look, if you just if you just narrate and say, oh yeah, you went, you wound your way through this dungeon, you're right in the heart of it, and then I can just snap my fingers and say, well, you guys are back out. That's not good DMing either, is it? Um, right. Because they, you know they would have to they would encounter obstacles along there. And I got my my biggest you know hang up was just this thing that where there are situate I understand one to one time in town and that's fine especially if you have you're doing multiple parties that's great it's like a shared world but if you can't if you don't have the ability to freeze time when you're in a dungeon and just say okay we'll pick up here you know when we can meet again you know but I'm getting here I'll I'll, I'll show you I guess um 
I was getting a little little salty here with uh, poor poor John. I guess I don't mean it. Uh, probably taking it out on. I don't like Jeffro very much, uh, so I'm probably taking it out on his uh, his backers. Uh, and, and I don't think it's a terrible idea on the face of it. But here, he, this guy's almost bragging. Imagine coming back to your weekly game on Friday to learn that the players on Tuesday killed and looted your characters. Well, crazy mouse. How would if we had like two groups going? How would you feel if you had a character one one session and you showed up and I smugly said, "Guess what? Your guys are dead." Say what the heck just happened here? <laughs> yes, DM drive by, right? DM drive by. <laughs> well, that's kind of what I said. I mean, you know, I'm, I would say my interest in the game would be a, it would wane, and I mean, I'm just, that's only human. Like you're you're putting effort into a character, and I, honestly, I think um, to, just to kill them kind of off camera and kind of you know be happy about it which some of these get don't doubt some of these guys are um they even called it uh elite gaming um and as i say here and this is probably something you'll understand greg it's one thing for your dumb decisions to kill your character that's that's fine but to have your character killed because you can only play on fridays rather than tuesdays or you know you have to miss a session because you're getting a surgery or something yeah um it just does, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm like, and I understand everybody's got their angle these days. Everybody's looking, you know, they would they would they want to do some work and uh, sell some stuff and get some attention. And I understand that to an extent. And that's why I think I'm being kind of rational, saying like I I get it. I understand the one to one stuff when you're in town. It can be pretty cool. I bet. I haven't tried it because you know I only run one group, and you know look, it's the same group pretty much. I've been running for twenty five years. You know, but just to not be able to freeze <laughs> time in, you know, when you can't get away or, you know, you would, your character would have no, your characters would have no reason to, like, let's say they're on the cusp of the treasure room. They've worked their way, you know, in, fought their way in, the treasure is in front of them, but it's two in the morning and it, they, everybody has to go to bed. Well, now you're just making in-game decisions based on real world situations. Just, to me, that's not good DMing. That's not terrible. Yeah, it's it's where you have to draw the line and say, "Oh, let's use some common sense here." But yeah, I mean, even even with the carousing <clears throat> rules uh, that I have, um, nothing results in really character death. It'd be you know, uh, it's more interesting to have something uh, you know, we like different, weird um, happen to that character. Uh, that then can be incorporated into play, right? right. So then, so uh, uh, the character um, insults a person of rank. Um, the character burns down the tap, or um, there's a mob after the player characters, or whatever. To me, that that's some um, fuel. Uh, that's the kind of fuel that runs the game, makes it interesting, makes it fun, and it also provides a little bit um, out. Uh, it provides a contrast to procedural dungeon crawling. Uh, it gives a little more flavor. I agree. Yeah, I think I think a lot of these folks they would be better served to just kind of think of some NPCs, uh, you know, some interesting NPCs that could populate the world that the characters may or may not run into. Um, I think people are getting kind of caught up on just just really silly stuff, and uh, you know, maybe it's just a weakness of me that I think I have to comment on it. Um, but I guess, you know, that's probably where I guess I am selling something to here, you know. Um, so whatever, um, you know, like I said, I'd, I don't hate the pro SR or anything. I, I don't particularly like Jeffro or, you know, his uh, his inner, you know, cadre of, you know, merry morons. Um, but I know there's also a lot of uh, crossover, you know, a lot of folks who, you know, say like, you know, I don't look, I don't like Jeffro, but, you know, he's got a couple of points about this and that. And yeah, I, I can get that. I understand that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's maybe where we meet in the middle, but um, you know, whatever, it's just. <laughs> well, it's there, just... Are, there are people who um, who put themselves out there as <clears throat> OSR experts. Um, and I don't see a lot of, um, I, I don't see a, a long path behind them to validate their perspective. So then let's say one of those people that we were talking about earlier who only plays in their monthly game does jump on X or does jump on Facebook or a group or a forum and says, oh, well, such and such said this. And um, 
they have this big following, so they must know what they're doing. Well, maybe they do, but maybe they don't. Uh, so, you know, it, it is good to comment on when people are talking silly, and that's reasonable. Yeah, and it's, I, of course, you know, I would never pass myself off as, as any kind of a leader in that. I'm just a guy with an opinion. Now, look, I have a unique perspective, but I'm certainly not, I guess, I guess I'm old school in that, you know, I, I pretty much have played all the earlier editions of D&D in their, in their time. You know, you and I are both old enough to have done that, you know, but, you know, for a long time, you know, we always looked ahead. You know, that was just our mindset. You know, we, sure. we never looked back. It was like, oh, let's next edition's coming out. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Even up to 5e, you know, okay. because uh, we we're kind of lost after fourth edition, you know, and 5e was kind of, you know, the little you know, the new toy, um, you know, but as, as you know, we've said time and again, it, it, it was OK at first um, and just uh, kind of didn't didn't work out after a while. So we just kind of politely set it down. And now we are kind of looking, you know, a little bit more backwards and um, well, like, people confuse uh, the rule of cool with the rule of new. And they're not the same thing. Just because something's new doesn't make it cool. Right. And uh, the current iteration of Dungeon Dragon stands is not cool. It might be new, but it's definitely not cool. Um, it has no edge. Uh, the texture has been sanded off. The corners have been knocked off and rounded off. There's, there's. So you know, to me, like how is how is a role playing game supposed to be different from some of the gritty stuff in the good Game of Thrones episodes? Um, it's supposed to be exactly that. You know, it has brothels. Um, there is some nudity. There, there is edge. Uh, people are getting killed, and they're being replaced with great characters. That is Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, that you know, and and so um, you know, I like. I, I, I think those the, just remember what makes good drama, whether it's fiction, whether it's TV, whether it's film, whether it's a role playing game, whether it's a short story, um, these human experiences, um, triumph and tragedy, you know, law, like loss, um, these things, um, in, they get a response as human beings. We read these things, we respond to them. Role playing games are no different. So that's the way I see it anyway. And when they when things like that happen organically, you know, and they're not forced upon the group, you know, by a a DM who has, you know, it wants to write a novel via his his role playing group, but they just kind of happen organically at the table. It's it really is magical, you know, like, oh shit, I didn't you know, there's there's times, you know, when I've I've after a session, you know, I'll be like, damn, I didn't I didn't think that would go that way at all, but like it, it really worked out. Uh, if, you, if you're, if you have a good group, you know, that you're kind of in tune with, um, you, you will get those, um, those situations, not all the time, of course, you know, cause if you, if you are getting them all the time, then somebody is probably forcing it. But uh, when they do happen, it is magical. Oh, it is. And you know, we've all played in games like that, right. Where you sit back from it. It's like, you know, even if you consider yourself a creative person, uh, creatively, you could not have, plotted that out the way it went like it just whew, players are off and those are some of the best sessions to me yeah I, I, I think I've told it before but you know there was a situation uh, it was probably 15 years ago now but um yeah Rogan's character <laughs> was uh you know, he was lying you know dying and uh you know our friend Gavin Morgan he was actually, we call him Gavin. He always plays the, this line of Morgan characters he was actually playing a guy called Fletcher Morgan uh, then but uh he had a choice to make. Um, not only was Rogan lying, dying, but so was his, I think, uncle, who was a pretty bad guy. And I don't want to say I set him up to be the villain of the story, but he had his plans and they were often at odds with the, you know, the group. And he was lying there dying. It, it, it was not planned. I, I hand to God will say it was not planned, you know, because it was a huge combat. And he was, they were both lying there almost, I don't want to say equal distance apart, but like and Fletcher Morgan was the only one that could do anything. I said, you can save, well, he knew, you know, you can save, still save Rogan's character or you have <laughs> your uncle there who's lying helpless and he chose to go over and kill his uncle and <laughs> Rogan's character died and uh, it's no, just, help his uncle. You said kill his uncle. No, he killed. That's when he killed Michael Scott and, Morgan. Yeah, and, and Rogan died. Yeah, yeah, right. 
Yeah. Oh. So it was, uh, yeah, it was um, pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, like I said, for not having any kind of a plan like that going in, you know, I, I didn't know. And look, I mean, if he was going to be sort of the kind of background villain, I wouldn't have had him lying helpless on the on the ground for, you know, somebody to cut his throat, uh, which is what happened. But you got to be willing to let go of stuff like that if you're a DM. Don't ever fall in love with um, a villain, an NPC, anybody like that. You know, just do your best to bring life into them and then let the chips fall where they may. Right. And, you know, take what's on the page and use it. So, for example, if you have a paladin in your party, that's exactly when you want to, okay, at exactly the same moment, the hill giants are going are coming to destroy this town and the black knight is riding to your castle to destroy it and uh, mm -hmm. take your take your maiden betrothed. What are you going to do? Yep. Right? And, and you put that lawful good paladin in that moral quandary and you just let it evolve. Yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with setting up situations like that. That is interesting that's to me that's good dming that it's good bad DMing. dming if they you have a pre-planned notion of which way he should go you just put it out there for him to choose yeah. and then you're like oh well that was interesting let's see what happens and then that's right a, after the game you think about okay what are the now the repercussions of this mm -hmm. that is yeah. that's the game as it's intended to be played yeah absolutely chris miller our friend twenty dollars the mad scribe don't forget to get a copy of Mad Scribe. You can get that on drive through as well as uh, Greg's Dragon Slayer RPG. Link in the description for both of these uh, fine films. What a great gift for your loved one on Valentine's Day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> get them both. Yeah. yeah. Dragon Slayer. Nothing says I love you like an issue of Dragon <laughs> or an issue of Mad Scribe yeah. and a hard cover of yeah, Dragon Slayer. For sure. Yeah. Uh, given everything that's been uh, going on with Wizards of the Coast in the past year and the possibility uh, they will be selling D&D. Do you think the D and D bubble is about to pop? And if so, what do you think will happen to indie OSR designers? Great question, there, Chris. Thank you again. Twenty dollars. What do you think, Greg? Uh, well, it depends what bubble we're talking about. Are we talking about the hipster bubble? Because who gives a crap about that? So, if we're talking about the hipsters who are really tourists anyway, they're poser tourists. They're going to come and go. Um, the people who've been who've been playing and creating OSR games have been here. We've weathered all the storms. We weathered the eighties moral panic. We're, we're, uh, we've weathered, you know, the social justice panic. We're still going to keep on doing the things that we do, creating awesome fun games to be played. It's not going to affect indie OSR publishers any, but the hipster bubble, it might affect that bubble. What do you think? Um, I don't want to say I'm slightly more pessimistic, um, but I, I, I do think there is a per, now just going to be a, a bit of a permanent divide. Um, I, I do, if you think about it, you know, a lot of these folks, they don't, um, they maybe don't have a ton of money, but the barrier to entry in something like D&D is pretty low, um, especially if they're willing to <laughs> honestly pirate books and stuff like that. Um, and they're playing online and they have no families, you know, maybe just kind of a menial job and a lot of spare time. Yeah, I can see them doing D and D for the near future. Now, will they get bored of it? Do they have the love of it that we do? Um, you, I, and Crazy Mouse, and you know all of our our gaming groups. No, I don't think they do because they they just it's it's almost like a copy of a copy, if you know what I mean. Um, it's not it, it's self. They're almost like self referential. You know, it's like we we go back to literature. They're scared of the literature that's the foundation of the game. We go back to the movies of, you know, like their early 80s. And I just released a video today, if you guys haven't seen it, about, uh, you know, what I think the best D&D &D movie is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they would find stuff like that problematic. So at a certain point, there's just going to be a disconnect with what they're doing. And, um, you know, the, the foundations of the game underneath it. Mm -hmm. But I also think some of them are just dumb enough to keep doing it. Like if, if they want to play a game where, you know, their tiefling just um, orders people around and <laughs> kills fascists or who they think are fascists, I think they would probably do that uh, in perpetuity. It's not it's not even like it's the same game that they're playing. Yeah, oh yeah. It's, it's similar. Yeah. It's like NBA and WNBA. 
They're both yeah. playing basketball. Yep. Yeah, I, I've always compared it to like Homo sapiens and like Neanderthals. This is like a different, it's almost like a different branch of the tree now it has formed. Um, I, I, I do think they'll be around. Hopefully we're the Neanderthals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll survive this time. Um, having said that, I do think, I don't know if the bubble's about to pop, but I think it's going to start to slowly deflate. Um, I just, I can't see this new edition being like a game changer just because they've already, they put themselves in a situation where they don't want to change it because they think they have a golden goose. But if it's just going to be a boring retread, I think a lot of people are going to be underwhelmed. Yeah. <clears throat> well, they, you know, they want to make it all online. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're putting all your eggs in, in one basket and that will make it harder. So if you just think of it logically, like if, if uh, let's say <clears throat> play to play it forward, say they move online for this generation of, of WOTC employees, uh, but they cycle through their employees very regularly. So who's going to be in charge of it in five years will, or six? Uh, will that be this? Will the impetus for being on, uh, completely online and micromanaging and microtransactions be what they want after that point? And then if that's the case, who, who are you going to have with any design chops to actually put forward a tabletop printed uh, rule book moving moving forward. So um, there are lots of questions. Um, time will will tell the tale on all of them. But <clears throat> again, it doesn't really matter because again, if, if if we take the idea of the hominid species, they're going one way, we're going another. We have a common ancestor, and that's about it. Um, we're just going to keep doing the things that we do, um, and it's not unlike working at a university where administrators cycle through every three or four or six years and they come forward with new long-term plans and so on and so forth. Shake things up and yeah. Yeah, but when the door closes, you still have to uh, mentor, lecture and educate your young people and what the admin says doesn't matter at all. The OSR is no different. We just keep churning and doing the thing, cool things, we follow the natural, we look back to the things that you mentioned, back to the, we find inspiration from the pages of fiction that inspired the game in the first place. We go back and we look at these old movies and we look at the new ones and we say, hmm, what's similar, what's different, and what could we pull forward, what do we want to leave behind? And uh, and that's completely natural. It, we um, The game has always been parasitic on popular culture, uh, on children's folk tales on those fantasy adventures, uh, on comic books and things of that nature. And we should keep our nose in those things um, and realize stupidity when we see it and realize super cool stuff when we see it too. Yeah. And we're not saying anything, everything new is necessarily bad, but mm -hmm. I think we, I think we can also understand that, um, you know, there are certain things that are just trying to be purposely antithetical to the, what made the game, want to be who would made them want to play the game to begin with that's what i never understand by the way charles anderson thank you so much five dollar super chat and nothing to say well nope, just... he said it's a blank super chat because i had nothing to add <laughs> okay, there you go. he texted we, that later <laughs> we appreciate that yep. so you got your words in anyway, anyway there, charles yep, thank, thank you so you much, so much. Yep. Mm -hmm. thank you yeah yeah so it's like it, it's something that i just never understand something brought you to this game you liked something viscerally, even if you don't want to admit it, even if you can't admit it socially because you're in a certain circle. But let's face it, you were drawn to it. And then all of a sudden you get in there and the first thing you know you want to do is, well, let's let's change those things that made, that made this game what I wanted to play to begin with. Really weird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. <clears throat> um, but you know, at the end of the day, um, it's important to be based. Uh, it's important to know what it, what your um, uh, ontology is, like what's important and valuable to you and how you like to play, how you like to write, how you like to design. Everything else is noise. And the noise can go on, and that's perfectly fine. That doesn't mean you have to pay attention to it. You can be definitely be informed, but recognize noise for what it is and stay true to who you are 
and the kinds of games that you like to play and uh, and then share them with your friends and your family and play together and uh, and reinvest in those bonds and, and it's friendships, uh, great friendships at the end of the day. And uh, and the other stuff just falls away, really. Yeah. I mean, you you play with friends, right? I mean, when, would, would you call people at your table friends? Some are oh, friends. Absolutely. Didn't you say some are students? Some some in the past have been uh, undergraduate students, yeah. And and um, so we've, uh, you know, just as you would at any workplace, you just bump into people, either colleagues or friends or uh, students, and, uh, you know, they learn that you, you play D&D, and, oh, I play too. Well, what do you play? Well, I play third edition. I, well, have you ever played an old school game before? Do you want to play? And and uh, and so I brought put people under my wing and brought them along. And then the funny part is they would go back to their third or third point three point five edition at the time and games, and they'd be like, "Yeah, now that I know old school tactics, these games are kind of easy." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I could I could see that. Have you ever had a situation where somebody was initially like very enthusiastic, like, "Oh man." Um, you know, you're, you're, you wrote Barrow Maze, you know, and uh, Dwaro Deep and, um, you know, all the other uh, mega dungeons, but then they maybe find your politics and then they kind of back off a little bit. Has that ever happened to you? Mm, not really, um, because quite honestly, as we said earlier, you know, I put out, you know, 500,000 words of games. <clears throat> and if those games were off-putting politically, uh, then people would be citing they'd be they'd say see where you wrote right here this makes you an x or a z and but people can't do that because i don't write that way yeah. and i'm not that way now they cannot like me for the things that i perhaps post on social media which is perfectly fine but but that doesn't mean it it uh, overrides my games um because i don't think that's fun and i don't think it's very cool either and uh good games are good games it doesn't matter you know, who makes them. Unfortunately, we live in a time where a lot of designers put their politics before their games. And I'm not somebody that, that does that. Yeah, the, I've been thinking about that lately because, you know, I just I kind of did like an informal list of, you know, f kind of like the RPG sites, you know, the uh, the, the notorious list of woke uh, game designers. I just, I just kind of wanted us to do ours. And um, I t I've been sort of honestly, to, to tell you the truth, it's been bothering me, you know, that we kind of consulted the chat, but like Matt Colville, who I'm sure, I'm sure you know who he is. You know, we kind of had him edging towards the more, you know, woke side. And the guy is a socialist and I, I don't particularly care for him. Uh, he's, he's kind of a, you know, <laughs> an erudite, you know, <laughs> it doesn't mix with like the hoi polloi. Um, but in the same respect, I don't know that he puts any of that stuff in his final product. I mean, maybe he does. I only, I have one Matt Colville product, you know, which I got, I think for way back for fifth edition strongholds and followers. And there was nothing in there like that. So, you know, here I am thinking like, even though I don't like him, I've made a couple of videos. They're very successful too. Boy, are his fans something else. Um, but in the same respect, am, am I doing him a little wrong by holding him to a different standard. And you know what, maybe I am, you know, maybe, maybe I was wrong there. Um, you know, cause people could say, Hey, just look at Greg Gillespie. He, he doesn't put his in, you know, even though, you know, he's conservative. So I don't know, something for me to think about. I guess I'm just spitballing there. <laughs> my guilty conscience. <laughs> well, I mean, people, um, people have looked at my, um, material through the lens of Christianity and it's okay. all there. Um, it's all there to be had. Um, but you know, so there are some, but but you let's look at, at original Dungeons and Dragons, look at Gygax's Dungeons and Dragons. It's there too. And, and it's there because it provides meaning to the game, right? What 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 do demons and devils mean if there's no if there's no good in the world? What does good mean if there's no evil to play off of it? And it pre prevent or presents uh, a dynamic uh, for play. So the the materials there um, and uh, the Eurocentrism is there because that's the game I'm ba I'm playing on. Um, I have said before, I mean, my family's Scottish, so the world that I'm based on is based in the UK, and and that that material's there. And people often look at my material and they'll say, 
you know, I see a lot of British TSR in, in what you're doing. And I, you know, take that as a compliment because it had its own sort of yeah. as well as, as the uh, American TSR. But, um, you know, so th there are some foundational items because, you know, you, it's impossible to make yourself a blank slate and just allow the material to pass through you. I can't, I can't divulge, divulge the, um, the um, obviousness that I'm male, that I'm a British extraction. Uh, I, can't, I can't divorce myself from that. Um, I embrace that. That's yeah. part of who I am. It makes me unique. And I bring that uniqueness to my games. Um, Gygax did that too. So uh, the model is there if, if you're looking for it. So for what it's worth. It's a good, it's a really good point. Um, probably doesn't get talked enough about, you know, just the kind of low key, you know, behind the scenes Christian underpinnings, you know, <laughs> I guess in the, in the game. And uh, why, why would, you know, why would Gary have chosen, chosen to have a paladin, you know, as a class, you know, a, a distinctly holy man, you know, meant to fight or, you know, woman, of course, um, you know, meant to fight, Crusaders. you know, these things. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things you probably don't think about, but uh, it's, it's a fair point. And, and you are correct. You know, everybody's going to ha have their own bias. And I think, I think most everybody is going to allow a little of that, you know, like, look, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, the sh mystery science theater, you know, the show. Mm -hmm. There's enough good in there that I can overlook, you know, the occasional, uh, you know, jokes about Republicans that they would do because I'm like, eh, you know, it's don't a don't be so up your own ass that, you know, you can't, you know, you can't laugh at yourself a little bit. Right. Um, you know, if it's if it's not pre prevalent and just hitting you over the head, then just, you know, just ignore it or, you know, whatever, laugh along with it. It's not that big a deal. Um, but, you know, when it becomes the the whole point of the endeavor, I think generally people understand like, oh, OK, we're being lectured to now. This is a sermon. This isn't uh, entertainment anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's um, it's all about shades. Right. So um, we're in a time where we're getting shades that are very heavy handed. And uh, I think we can all acknowledge that. Um, and it's heavy handed to the point of being off putting. Um, but but that doesn't mean it's the only way of doing it. It just means we live in a polarized cultural time um, and role playing games have started to take on that polarization. But it doesn't this is not the way um, to go reverse Mandalorian. Um, yeah. You know, the, the way is to pro provide games that allow people to um, allow their game individual gaming group to take on the flavor that it wants to take on. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna I'm going to divorce my game my notion of what good Dungeons and Dragons would be from its Christianity, from its Western Eurocentrism, uh, from its um, male and female uh, understandings of gender. Patrick Demo, five dollars, reading Dragon Slayer, and hearing this podcast has inspired me to continue work on my own role playing game. Thank you both, Patrick Demo. You are most welcome, and best of luck. Very welcome. Yeah, yes. and in the future, Patrick, when you get more up and going on that, please let us know. Yeah. We'd love to yeah. chat with you about that. Yeah, yeah I get to, you get yep. something in the can there. Yep. Um, we, we'll talk to the yeah. we'll talk to the. <laughs> the and that's the thing too. Um, <laughs> if anybody's out there and listening, so uh, the back of Dragon Slayer has a third party license. So you know, if you you're inspired, you want to make um, you know a supplement or a module or whatever. Go for it. Do it. Um, you know, make it your own and um, and have fun with it. And, you know, hopefully, you know, people will play it, too. And I, just to let you know, I guess I'm still working on mine, just plugging away a little bit. I've, like I think I've told everybody I found a good artist, uh, let's just say very close to home. Um, so um, it's, it's very inspiring, you know, and I've been at first it was just kind of a generic OSR. And then I kind of had to go back. You know, when I kind of said, you know, I'm going to do it for Greg's first uh, because I, a, I want to. It's because it's a really cool system. I mean, it shouldn't be that hard to convert. Uh, oh, no, no, it's it. not. Yeah. Um, you can you can. Uh, the, it's very, very important to me. As I said, when we talked about the definition of OSR, it means TSR D&D &D compatible. 
And that's really what we're talking about. So you can take Dragon Slayer, you could play it with any second edition module, you could play it with any first edition module, you could play it with any BX module, and um, and then any any of the new games that that somebody makes uh, for the OSR, you could you know you could play those adventures with it too. And and that compatibility is very very core to me. And um, and again, it's just in praise of Gary Gygax, the amazing game that he made. And this is his 50th anniversary year, um, and that's the way I look at it. A. Warren Johnson, $5 Canadian. Conflict drives motivation. Politics mm-hmm. aside, games without frontiers lack a key component of what makes a game a game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The only thing said, that Karl Marx ever got right was that conflict promotes change. And yeah. um, I definitely agree with that. We get stale. It's, it's good to have a little bit, you know, shake things up from time to time and uh, present opinions and have them countered and have adult debate and uh, and just, you know, um, provide some stimulus to how we think about games. Yep, for sure. Howard Hughes, good Lord. Our, our Arriba, be- Arriba. <laughs> our, benef- our benefactor. <laughs> we were saying uh, last week, Greg, like, how- is this the real Howard Hughes? Because he always comes in with like a huge super hits, chat. Hits us with a hammer yeah, at the yeah, end. Hits us with a hammer. That's amazing. I was starting to say, uh, how, how long are your fingernails? Uh, as Rogan said, uh, do, do you have jars of urine on your shelf? Like like the real Howard Hughes? Howard, thank you so much. Uh, you are a mensch. Uh, excellent stream tonight, gentlemen. Congratulations on Dragon Slayer, Greg. Uh, I think we all wish you that. Thank you for producing products that pay homage to the root of our hobby. Cheers. Howard, again. Thank you very um, much. I'm very humbled um, that you do this. Um, don't don't ever feel obligated. By the way, you can always just sit in the chat and not give anything, and uh, we would still love you. But uh, thank you so much for yeah. uh, helping the channel out. Um, yeah, put it's a amazing. plaque <laughs> on the mantle coming down the stairs yeah. with his name on it. The Howard Hughes Memorial. Uh, <laughs> you have to make. You might have to switch out DD for HH. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, remember, guys. The um, the link for Dragon Slayer, um, the drive through link is just in the uh, description, but you can find it there uh, at drive through just by searching for it. If you uh, want to think about it, that's fine, too. So if um, they ordered the book, Greg, when would they get it? Um, well, that's up to um, drive through. I mean, it took me. So I ordered the last print proof on January 13th and uh, got it today. So about two um, and a half weeks. Well, three longer weeks, than three that. Weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, three weeks. weeks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, leaning to four. But um, who knows? Um, but, you know, I, w- I would say it'd be at least at least two weeks would be fair. Uh, maybe leaning to three. And they're fulfilling us Kickstarter, who back the Kickstarter right now as we speak? Is that... Uh... Say again? Now, they're, they're, they're fulfilling the, kick, the Kickstarter right now. Yeah, so people get their codes and then they just go to Kickstarter or excuse me, uh, drive through and uh, and redeem their codes. And uh, oh, okay, and yeah, then... that's that's how you're going to do it. That, that and that's fine. Yeah, so you just get a get a free, get a code to get your uh, book right from uh, yeah right from drive through. Cool. That's right. Well, I'll be, uh, I'll be definitely be looking forward to that because, uh, like I said, I do have the PDF, but man, something about holding uh, a book like that and all that having all that artwork in your hands is uh, <laughs> something else. Well, let me know how many copies you need, and then I'll get that sorted out tomorrow. I'll send you something to you. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Um, well, that's uh, that is awfully kind of you. Yes, I was very proud to back the Kickstarter, but um, you know, I'm sure um, if we had an extra copy here around. Um, well, the wife needs a copy for Valentine's Day. Exactly. Uh, there, there you go. go. What yeah. a great gift. <laughs> <laughs> I was at work the other day, and somebody said, uh, Hey, Double D, what are you and your wife doing for Valentine's Day? I said, I've been married for 30 years. I said, nothing. <laughs> he, he's like, see? <laughs> he's been married a while, too. We have these young girls in our area. <coughs> it's crazy to remember that Valentine's Day is still a huge thing, you know, when you're in your mid-20s. It's crazy. Oh, well. Well, any... um. Any kind of final thoughts here, wrapping up? Anything we missed, Greg? Uh, I'm not getting rid of you, but I just, uh, you know, getting towards uh, an hour and a half here. I don't want to keep you all night. I know you're working tomorrow. Yeah, um, just that I appreciate very much having me on. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, everyone that, that participated in the chat. And uh, it's been great to share the journey as we've been going along. And 
thanks everybody for their patience. It's meant a lot. And um, I, you know, I hope if it inspires people to game um, in this 50th year of anniversary of the hobby, then, um, then, then that's all I could ask for. We'll sneak one final question in for, for you. Uh, what are you working on next? Any, uh, anything in the hopper? Yeah, so I've um, I've already completed the um, 34 inch by 34 inch full color poster map for the game world yeah. in which all the dungeons are set. Yeah. So the next thing will that's already done. Um, so I'll be um, just taking my notes and translating the notes on the the gazetteer of the map that I've got into uh, um, into a, a, a short book, probably about the size of the Mega Dungeon Monster Manual. And um, that will provide you know, um, a gazetteer of all the forests and the towns and so on and so forth, so that um, it'll flush it a little bit more. And that will also build into and incorporate the last two of the six part Mega Dungeon series. So it'll all work together when they're all done. That's how that'll work. That's sweet. Oof. Very, very nice. All right. Well, um, I'll tell you what, it's always a pleasure. Uh, talking to you, Greg. Um, you were, you know, one of the early guys. So I think some people wonder like, gee, why, why does Double D love Greg so much? Because uh, you you were one of the guys, uh, you and folks like DM James, you know, and even Pundit, um, you know, shouted me out. But I remember you said like, hey, I, I like what you're doing. You know, I'd love to talk to you. And, uh, you know, you really didn't have much. You that's know, how to, it started. Yeah, you didn't have much to gain at the time because I wasn't really that you know, big. I'm still not that big, but um, you know, I'm a little, little bit bigger. But um, I always appreciate when smart people are um, interested in talking to me. Um, and uh, you're a smart guy, interesting guy. So uh, anytime. Oh, I feel the same way. And I immediately, when I was listening to some of your early stuff, I was like, "That's a person I want to talk to." And his friends are cool too. And we'd have a lot in common. Yeah. And and we do. So it's been great. And it's been a great, been a great friendship. And I'm so glad that yeah. you played. In my game, I'm just disappointed I didn't kill you. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was being smart there a little bit. Uh, minimize risk, right? Yeah, you know, my, my wife yeah. keeps saying too, she's like, because, you know, she was listening to uh, some of the sessions. You know, I've told her about you too. And she's like, when's when's he coming down here? When's he going to come by? And I'm like, ah, someday he's going to make me that an invite. I'm not. <laughs> Greg, you know, Greg I'm, it's I'm a, within range. It's an open invite. Um, I know you and I both have some some things going on right now in our, our personal lives, but um you know, maybe when when things get a little bit better, you know, maybe even a little bit later this year, um, yeah, come on down and uh, we'll we'll treat you. Guys you could even meet halfway. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we yeah. could. But if you came here, you know, you could game with us and you know, yeah, that's, that's my plan. The, so yeah, it's not that much more. Yeah, we we can yeah, spend we'll, we'll, a uh, couple of days. Yeah, we'll start out our families, and then when that's in the rearview mirror, we'll get it done. Yeah. yeah. Yep, for sure. All right, brother. Uh, we're gonna say goodnight. Remember, order Dragon Slayer if you're uh, interested. It's a great game. I have the PDF. You're not going to, um, you're not going to regret it. Um, link in the description. So uh, we'll talk to you uh, very soon, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Have a good yep. night. Yep. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Yep. Cheers. All right. Always jazzed when I talk to uh, <laughs> to, to Greg. <laughs> so the know. book is done. You order it. You're going to get it in about about three weeks. Give give drive through has has been notoriously uh, slow or fast. Slow, slow these days, yeah. So give it. You're gonna have to give it. So it just means look if you want it, you know, and you think you're gonna pull the trigger, just do it. I mean, look if you're like us and you have, you know, just you're blessed to have nice jobs and all that. Just don't think twice. Just do it. As uh, John Madden used to say, "Don't worry about the horse being blind. Just load the wagon." You always know it's a big game if Daryl Green's returning punts. That's right. That's right. It's, it's probably about three people in the chat that are like, yeah, I know what that <laughs> I know what that means. <laughs> um, yeah, so it seemed like, uh, as usual, uh, the chat uh, is uh, into Greg, as they should be. Yeah, th uh, World Bigfoot Central. Everyone just take two seconds and go click the like button. Yeah, yeah, if you guys could. We should uh, see... Chris Miller just said it. We need 104,000 likes. <laughs> and Panther understands that Madden quote. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I did, uh, and I did a uh, video today. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, you know, you can watch it later. But um, if you remember, I did the um, <laughs> the notorious live stream with uh, Conan the Destroyer that got, kept getting shut down. I had all that footage, uh, Crazy Mouse. So I'm like, I'm not going to. 
I'm not just going to, you know, delete all that footage. So I'm like, right. I, bet, I bet I could make a pretty good video, it pretty much going over the same stuff that I wanted to do in the stream, just doing it in the video form. In the video. Yeah, where they're, they're a lot more forgiving for using, you know, clips and stuff like that. Although I didn't push it. I didn't use, like, the music and all that because they, they would have dinged me for that. But You could have rickrolled everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Rick Roll. <laughs> Conan swings and never going to give you yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, so I was actually pretty pleased uh, with the way it turned out. Um, I'm, I'm actually not getting half bad at editing stuff so um see it's, it's a skill if you are if you want to get into this game the youtube game um you don't need a lot you know but eventually you are going to need to learn how to edit things to just i don't know make, make things a little bit more interesting than just being a talking head now you can you can still be a talking head you know and if you're interesting enough you know people are going to watch you but um it never hurts to have these skills all right. Greg just typed in he liked Conan the Destroyer, despite yeah. many that didn't. Yeah, and um, it's, as I say in the video, it's it's certainly the inferior movie uh, to Barbarian. Um, but damn, if it isn't a great D&D movie. Uh, in my opinion, the best. Is that the one with Grace Jones? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah Grace Jones and um, Wilt. Yeah, I knew, yep. What I say, we, we, you might like. I've never seen it, but I know that. Oh, we got to watch it. I know that. Um, You'd like it. Grace Jones did one. I yeah. didn't know that was the name of it. Yeah. And I knew Wilt was in one, too. You, the, you, how many ones were there with Conan with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Just two. Just there was a, There was going to be a. Th well, two and a half. Because there's another movie called Red Sonia with uh, Brigitte. Oh, okay. And she plays a. Uh, more or less, I think, like um, the Marvel character. Like, that's, I think, who developed Red Sonia, if I'm not mistaken. But she's meant to be in the world, kind of like a our Robert E. Howard world, like Conan. And um, <clears throat> Arnold Schwarzenegger was in Red Sonia, but they didn't have, like, the Conan license uh, to use. But he played the same character, and his name was, like, Caliban or something like that. It was, like, really, really close. Uh, even though she was certainly the star of that movie, and it's an okay movie, it's not great, but it's an it's an okay movie. Um, has some pretty cool things in it. He'll pop in ever so often, and then towards the end, he's in it. Um, you know, for the for the most part. Um, it's a, I remember reading how Grace Jones didn't have any control with her staff and almost killed everybody. Yeah, I think I heard those stories too. I, I mentioned in the um, in the video, Over Prince Kelsey. Caliban. Yeah, yeah, yeah Caliban. I remember watching that. I'm like, Caliban? Why doesn't he just call himself Conan? You know, I was 13, 14 years old at the time. and didn't didn't understand the complex uh, nature of uh, movie rights and all that stuff. Um, but the, you got, you've got you probably heard some of these, how strong Wilt Chamberlain mm -hmm. was. Yep. I mean, so people think like, oh, it's, you know, strongest athlete ever in any sport. It's got to be a football player, right? It's almost assuredly it was Wilt Chamberlain. The guy, the guy was just so strong. <clears throat> I mean, it was. There's like a ten, like a ten minute video just with stories about people and their interactions with him and his strength. Like just lifting two hundred pound people. Like some guy came up. They were at some event. They were on opposite sides of a fence, and the guy's like, "Well, I'll meet you over there, Wilt. I, I got to go over where the um where the entrance is." He's like, "No, no, no, don't do that." He he literally picked the guy up and lift and just lifted him over the fence with one arm. This guy's like 200 pounds. Just think about, like, we don't understand, like, you're a tall guy. You're, mm -hmm. what, 6'3"? Six, 6'4". Six, yeah. The other night we were out, and we were somebody at our table at this murder mystery thing me and Mrs. Mouse went to with this other, with this couple from... Sophia's school. Oh, and Sophia just trended. I told her that yeah, I would make her trend tonight. <laughs> we'll tell her. Um, this guy was 6'8". And like, that's tall. Yeah. But like, that's like how tall LeBron is. But this guy wasn't like big like LeBron. Mm -hmm. So think about how big like Shaquille O'Neal really is. Yeah. Yep. We were watching a basketball game back in the day. It was a Lakers game on Easter Sunday. And Derek Fisher was standing next to Shaquille O'Neal. And someone said, oh, my gosh, look how tiny he is. We looked him up. He's like the same size as you. 
and yeah. that's the, like that's what you would look like <laughs> next to like Shaq. Well, my my son had to uh, it, uh, several years back had to get a very serious operation at the uh, Cleveland Clinic, and uh, it was the year after the Cleveland Cavaliers uh, won the their championship. You know, and like like everyone else, kind of we're kind of in that area, you know, so we all loved it. Um, and we got word, you know, when my son was recovering, he was in, you know, kind of like the uh, intensive care, I guess. And uh, they're like, yeah, the Cavaliers are coming. And we're like, you know what? You know, and they're like, yeah, they they come around here, and um, you know, they just come or come around and say hello. And uh, Le- LeBron James wasn't there, and um, but it was everybody else. On was the it ca- Tristan Thompson there? Yeah, Tristan Thompson yeah. was there, who's a huge dude. Then the reason I said Tristan Thompson, he was probably the tallest of those. He was, players, yeah, and he was. Right? Everybody, they came into the room, and even like if you watch like an NBA game, like even the short guys, they're about as tall as me, and I'm six four. I'm a pretty pretty tall guy. Um, the only the only guy uh, that I was a little bit taller than was uh, their coach at the time, which was uh, Tyron Lue. Um, I was I was actually a little taller than him, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they were all very very nice, uh, very nice people. Um, I remember I, uh, <laughs> I thank J.R. Smith. I'm like, man, you hit those two shots in the uh, in the NBA final. He's know, probably like, thank game you. Seven. Yeah, thank you. No one remembers that. <laughs> at first, I thought he was going to say that. He was, he was looking at me like I was. He was like, huh? And then I said, right when you came out of halftime, you know, you hit those shots, and he's like, oh yeah, man, I just do what I do, <laughs> and he's like that. I'm like, oh cool. J.R. Smith is, um, in real life, a really good golfer. And because he went right from high school to the NBA, he had four years of college eligibility left. Mm -hmm. So he went back to some school and actually played college golf for them. Oh, really? Yeah. That's that's weird. Yeah. Crazy. Who else is it? Uh, Kyrie Irving, who even you non-sports fans, and we'll get off the sports talk in a moment. You'll just have to forgive us this diversion. But uh, they were playing the Lakers that night. And... uh, I think my son maybe asked him, like, you know, he was still coming kind of in a fog after his surgery. And he's like, oh, how are you going to do tonight? You know, you're playing the Lakers. And he's like, he's like, oh, you're going to win? And Kyrie Irving's like, oh, yeah, man, that's easy money. (laughs) That's easy money. (laughs) That's when the Lakers really sucked. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Actually, but really good group of guys. I'm sure most of those athletes, you know, I mean, a lot of them. Get unfairly disparaged, but in person, they're, they're very generous. Um, very nice. That's their. That's not part of their job. That's their free time. Yeah. When they go to those yeah, hospitals, they, yeah, they don't have to do that. But uh, you know, you could tell some of them were, were really into it, and I don't know. it was very cool. Anyway, it was a cool experience. Um, let's see. You and your foosball. Are you are you talking to us, Chris? That's basketball. I hope people out there, I I mean, I know that there's some non-sports fans in our group. (laughs) I hope people do realize that there's a big football game this weekend. Yeah, anybody uh, anybody want to venture uh, to put in the chat who you think is going to win? I mean, we don't need to even talk about the game, but just to know that there is a game. Because Double D and myself have people in our family who are like, what? I didn't even know that game was that day. Yeah. I am all, trust me, I understand there's a lot of people who are like, I just don't get sports. I'm not into them. That is cool. I get it too. But, but you do know there's a game yeah, this but weekend, right? For these people that go around like, because we, we both have had this. Oh, the Super Bowl's this weekend? Uh, all right, come on. I mean, it's you, you got to know the Super Bowl at least. I don't expect you to know any other game is happening. I don't even expect you to know when the season's starting, but Jesus, it's a freaking Super Bowl. Um. Hoping for the Niners, says Xavier. Can't stand the Chiefs. Yeah, these Chiefs seem to be uh, getting on everyone's nerves. Uh, I think it's so can... weird. I, you know, that Harvey Dent was right. You know, <laughs> like people love the Chiefs now. Like I can't stand the Chiefs. Yeah, and it's so weird. Um, I made the comment the other day. People are don't want to hear about how great the Patriots' run was and Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. Well, you need someone to do that, and that's the Chiefs. Yeah. So, exactly. in other words, if you are can't stand the Chiefs, then you must really love the Patriots and Tom <laughs> Brady because we're going to talk about them until someone can yep. top that. Torah NFL is too woke to give money to. Yeah, I don't give a, I don't give them much money. Um, but um, yeah, I think the one thing I hate about the NFL now is just those stupid end zone like writings that they have. At this point, they might as well 
just put like eat your vegetables <laughs> oh, along, I know along the back of yeah. the, the back line because it's like that's the effect it has. It's like nobody just it's so so dumb. Everybody's just rolling their eyes at it. It, it, it's bordering on, uh, on on uncool. Yeah, getting a little too woke, um, but I still love the game because I grew up with it. Um, I was we, I was one of those nerds that could kind of had a uh, foot in both worlds. Makes a lot of money. Yep. For the record, I think I'll be going for the Niners too. You know, it's got to be bad if I'm rooting for a uh, San Francisco team, but uh, I do like the um, I do like the quarterback uh, Brock Purdy. It's a good story. For those of you who don't know, he was the last guy drafted. No one wanted him. Nobody wanted him. Mr. Irrelevant, they call him. The last guy drafted in the NFL draft. Which always was weird because there's guys that sign free in the NFL who don't get drafted. (laughs) Figure they'd be a little bit more irrelevant. But All right, enough sports talk. Uh, These guys are going to revolt. I can sense them. We lost seven already. That's right. right. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Howard Hughes, go get those seven back. Yes. Go buy them back. <laughs> Chris Miller, text somebody. Go get them back. Um, all right. So um, I think we're about, I think, uh, I was thinking, i tell you what, uh, I was almost going to do a uh, auto and Roland with, uh, with just uh, auto here, but uh, maybe it's not right. Uh, we'll wait till the gang's back together. It might be a couple of weeks. We got some schedule stuff. We got some housekeeping notes. Next week's Valentine's Day, and even though <laughs> me and Mrs. Mouse don't really celebrate, I imagine I'd be in a mouse trap if I yeah. was like, I'll see you later. Yeah. And also the week after that is we have, a, uh, we have three children, me and Mrs. Mouse. Our middle one, Derek... That's his actual birthday. Yeah, yeah. So he's Mouse is going to be out a little bit. We'll see if we can't get uh, Mr. Maybe Pew, Pew, Pew Pew. Mr. Pew Pew. Here we go. Back show it up you, a show little, you guys this. Uh, the, the glare is right on it. Yeah, Back it up. A, there you yeah, go. Gotta, right there. Perfect. Yeah, get into focus. All right, so see these? Uh, these are going to be the new stands. This is Otto. And uh, this is uh, Ro- Roland. Whoops. There you go. I got these at... Um, our old friend James from Neckbeardia, he sold this. I don't know if they're still available. I know you can you can look around, but uh, they're actually pretty cool. Oh, look at that! Yeah, it's all it is is just it's a bunch of these. Remember those when you were little? Yeah, I'm like, damn it, I'm gonna do it because honestly, like Dragon Bane comes with like their own standees, but they're they're kind of small. And I'm like, you know what? These are big and chunky, and um, I like them. Yeah, you can see them on stream. So I'm like, you know what? These would be pretty cool for the channel. So uh, that's kind of why I ordered it. So can't wait to bust these out for when you guys uh, start skulking around uh, the streets of Carlsfell again. I got, I got some situations for you. You know, we'll see what you guys do. Um, but yeah, we, we it's probably proper that we wait um, for uh, Rogan to be here to play uh, Roland. So I'm sure the chat will too. Um, I think. We will probably uh, let it go here, guys. Um, see if there's any other streams out there. You can. Um, Chris Miller said that we're not at 94 likes. People, go hit that like button. Yeah, come on, guys. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like, like. I love this place. Love it. <laughs> love and subscribe. Love this place. <laughs> I wish. I wish you people, because that was like from the early 90s. Uh, go look up after the stream on YouTube, BKTV, B-K-T-E-E-V-E-E. It was a... It was a uh, Give your um, Roku a shake. Oh, yeah. That's a, yeah I'm just going to turn it off. Um, Burger King in the early 90s tried table service. <laughs> that's what they were promoting. Like, you go to Burger King, you sit down... And then, like somebody brings you <laughs> brings you your food. When was this? We're talking like ninety one, ninety two. Okay. Before that, do you remember when Burger King had sliders? Yes. And they called them Burger Buddies, and you'd get three in a pack. Yeah, yeah. And Evander Holyfield was their pitch man, and it was like pop a pop a buddy in the mouth. <laughs> pop a buddy in the mouth. <laughs> well, me and this girl up the street, Jenny Min. I love you. We used to go to this Burger King all the time, but we didn't know the city very well. We didn't know the street it was on, so we always would say the wrong street, but our good old friend Jamie Ritchie found us. 
<laughs> but we would be out there. Pop a buddy in the mouth. Um, yeah, burger buddies. Burger buddies. That's back when sliders might not even have existed. Maybe Burger King started it. Who knows? Well, for the mass, like the mass market, I bet they did because I don't remember McDonald's or Wendy's. And even though McDonald's doesn't have table side service, they deliver to your table now. They give you that tent and you just go sit down. They do, yeah. 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 So it's almost like it's come full circle. Well, they kind of don't want, I can understand why because so much stuff is made to order now. They don't want everyone just standing at the register. It's deterring people from maybe coming in thinking the line's too long. So they just give you a tent, get you the hell out of the way, and. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Go sit down. Right. Yep. All right. Well, you know what? Let's uh, let's leave them wanting uh, a little bit more, shall we? Uh, please don't bite my ear. I just want to meet my knees. <laughs> I was here for that. Ow! I was here at Double D's house for that fight. We watched yeah. that fight. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Crazy. Um. God, that's that seems like it was uh, just yesterday, and it says twenty five years ago. Thank you, everybody. People are correcting me right away. White Castle's been around, and they started sliders. That's true. Yeah, thank Th- you. That thank was you. yeah. That's their whole thing. Christelle's. I and, didn't uh, know about. Yeah. I didn't know that they've been around for so long. We don't have a White Castle even near us anywhere. Yeah, yeah there's the closest one we get to is like at Gen Con. I think there's one in Indianapolis. It's kind of in a depressed area, though. You know what's weird is, uh, Mrs. Double D and myself, we both make a version of White Castle sliders at home. Yeah. I just Very made good. some for Mrs. Mouse. That's what she wanted for her birthday dinner. Nice. So we did those, and we did, we got a deep fryer, so I made some fresh-cut fries. Yep. So, Chris Miller, the mad scribe, $10. He used to work at Burger King when I was cleaning tables. I'd fill a clean ashtray with, pe- <laughs> with pepper and lick it clean in front of customers. <laughs> As uh, Jabba the Hutt said, Chris, uh, you're my kind of scum, fearless and inventive. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much. By that the way, was, that was good. Yeah, I want to point out I, I submitted something today and it, I'm not going to guarantee it's going to get published because it might not be up to Chris's standard. So I think he's still looking at it. But I did submit something for publication in Mad Scribe. So uh, if you guys uh, want to see what uh, Double D has, uh, has put out into the world, um, if he so chooses to use it, um, just uh, order Mad Scribe magazine. Why don't you? You get about four issues a year. Yeah, quarter right to your house. Yep. Right to your house. Yep, yep. And you guys know Chris. Look, he's he's OG. He he's here from like the beginning of the streams until you know most of the time till towards the end. Um, so he's a he's another cool guy. Um, I don't know, Chris. I don't know if you'd ever want to come on and talk. I know you're you're kind of a behind the scenes guy, but um, if you ever do want to talk, hit me up on Twitter. Because I'd be, I'd love to just you know have you on on the show even if it's just for a brief segment, um, you know you're you're more than welcome. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of there's there's some very cool dudes in this sphere. There's a lot of morons, um, quite frankly. Um, but you know, for every Jeffro, there's a there's a Chris Miller and you know, Dungeon Delver and you know, Neckbeardia James DM James. I got. One of Chris Miller's mags. It's dope. Yep. So did Frank Avina. I guess he was not not here tonight, huh? I did not see him. Yep. Okay. Um, I'll keep it for him. Um, he, he's bound to show up. All you guys collectively remember, if you see Frank Avina, say, oh, you have a magazine coming. Did you forget? Because uh, I do want... That always bothers me. Um, it'll, it'll bother me now. Until um, it happens. Until it happens, right. yeah. Yep. It's like... So. All right. Um... We will uh, send you guys out. Um, I'm on StreamYard, so I don't have a, a good collection of um, music videos. Um, but I tell you what, instead, I'm going to send you out with the w- promo. Yeah, I'm going to send you out with Greg's promo. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, any last words? That's my quarterback. That's my, <laughs> That's my team. It's my quarterback. Oh yeah, he is. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, here's that uh, that Dragon Slayer uh, promo again. We'll send you out with it. You guys take care. Have a great week. Um, if you guys could, I know you guys are a uh, pretty cool bunch. If you want to say a prayer, my dad is um, having heart surgery tomorrow. He's getting a new heart valve, um, so he is in his mid 80s. And um, yeah, any uh, any good thoughts? Um, Send them. Send them. 
yep, um, they are uh, very, very much uh, appreciated. All right, so you guys, um, we'll see you uh, next week, peeps. Love you. Peace. Hey.